Hi, everybody, and welcome to this edition of the Taking Control of Your Diabetes podcast. I am one of your hosts, Dr. Jeremy Pettis. I am joined, as always, by my good friend, colleague, and co-host, Steve Edelman. So uh, if you're just tuning in, Steve and I are both endocrinologists at the University of California, San Diego, both been living with type 1 diabetes since we were 15 years old. And the title or the topic of today's podcast is LADA, L-A-D-A. So what, what does that mean? What does that stand for? Well, it stands for Latent Autoimmune Diabetes of Adulthood. And this is such an important topic because it is... Um, something that there's a lot of confusion around. What is the diagnosis? When people do have it, they can often be misdiagnosed. So let's start at the the top. What would you describe or what would you say LADA is, Steve? Well, basically, it's getting type 1 diabetes later in life. Mm -hmm. And it is an important topic because uh, many healthcare professionals have no clue about what LADA is. And Mila will tell us her story, her nightmare story, what she went through, and it leads to the misdiagnosis of type 1 diabetes. But we'll get into it. But uh, as you know quite well, people with LADA don't present like you and I did at 15, crash and burn, diabetic ketoacidosis, ICU. Uh, it's, a, it's a little slower beta cell destruction, and that's what throws people off, plus the age. Right. So we are going to be joined by a very special guest to talk about this, you know, kind of her, you know, struggle or kind of story with this. But LADA, to be honest, is a term that we're trying to get rid of. It's very confusing to people. Um, but essentially what it is, is people that got type 1 diabetes when they were adults. So first of all, we know now that about half of people diagnosed with type 1 diabetes are actually diagnosed as adults. But we also know that it presents a little bit differently. So you and I, Steve, when we got type 1 when we were 15, it was kind of a textbook uh, of what happened. We started drinking all the time, water, um, started peeing a lot, you know, um, losing weight, all the kind of things. And then we went into diabetic ketoacidosis, and it was a very kind of clear-cut diagnosis. We had type 1 diabetes. When people get it later in life, it tends to smolder a little bit. Their blood sugars can be kind of a little bit high. And because they're usually going to see their adult provider who sees a lot more type 2 diabetes, it's very common that they can be diagnosed or misdiagnosed with type 2. It can be very frustrating for them to get the right diagnosis. And it's important to know that there's actually different things going on immunologically. When people are diagnosed as kids, it tends to be a more aggressive immunologic t attack. People lose their beta cell function right, you know, right away. And as adults, it, it just is a little bit of a slower process. So that's why they can behave differently. But at the end of the day, it's all type 1 diabetes. So people say, do I have LADA? Do I have type 1 and a half? Do I have type 1? We're all blood brothers. It's all type 1 diabetes. It's just the age of, of you know, when you got it. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I think I can think of so many patients who just went along that route. They were older than teen or even young adult. They get diagnosed with type two. They're skinny mini. And the doctors actually put them on a weight loss diet. Mm -hmm. They say, are you kidding me? And then they give them type two drugs. And as, as you know, they, they may work a little bit uh, for a while just because some of the sulfonylurea drugs stimulate the pancreas. But in the end, they all require insulin. Yeah. And so I write, I think we should get rid of that phrase. You know, when I listen to the song, uh, Bobby McGee, she goes, la di la di la da. Mm -hmm. I want to do something really funny about that. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll workshop that after, you know, <laughs> offline. Um, but yeah, and I would say the last thing before we bring Mia on is that back when we used to do the, our conferences in person, which we were getting back to now soon, um, Every once in a while, I would do an actual session in person on, on LADA or type 1 in adults. And I would say the, the majority of people in those sessions were just angry that it took so long to get the diagnosis. They were so frustrated. They were kind of felt failed by the medical community. Um, and they wanted to kind of vent that. And I do think it's a, a unique you know area where people can bond over that even though that what they've gone through is traumatic and, and unfortunate and upsetting, but it's, it's common. So that's why we're going to transition to bringing Mila on to talk to us about who she is, what she's been through, and kind of what she's doing about it. So Mila, say hi to the folks, and I know you wanted to introduce yourself, so so take it away. Hello. Hi. I'm so excited to be talking to both of you today, um, but also just sharing my story because, like you mentioned, it is so common 
Um, and you think it's not common until you meet a bunch of people who have gone through the same thing. But I'm Mila Clark. I am a journalist and I'm also a diabetes health coach. Um, I write a blog called The Hangry Woman, um, and I also write for a bunch of different publications. So I freelance for The Washington Post, Healthline, um, Eating Well Magazine, all the general ones you can think of that focus on diabetes health. And um, I was diagnosed in 2016 when I was 26 years old. So I, I wasn't shocked by my diagnosis, but I was saddened by it. Um, my family has a history of type two diabetes. And so my mom, um, she passed away last year, but she was living with type two after she had gestational diabetes with both my brother and I, um, and I was kind of familiar with diabetes, but for some reason, I just didn't think it would happen to me. Um, I was overall pretty active and really like cooking a lot for myself, focusing on my health. And so when I got to this point where I was exhausted all the time and like constantly sweaty, uh, the same kind of symptoms that you mentioned, I was peeing all the time. Um, I couldn't sleep. And my partner at the time was like, maybe this is something that you should just go get checked out. And I was like, I'm just tired. (laughs) I'm just working a lot and I'm putting in a lot of hours at work and I'm just, you know, I need a vacation. Like that's, that was what was going through my mind, but I was like, yeah, maybe it's a good idea to just like go get a checkup and see what's going on. Um, and then I went to a primary care physician and, I got my results back. And what was interesting was that like, they never call you back the same day to tell you that you need to book an appointment. So when the Those office damn, called, damn doctors, man. yeah, <laughs> the sons of bitches. Oh my God. <laughs> well, I was terrified. I was like, wait, why do I need to come back so soon? And, um, you so know, they like called I, you and said, come back in to talk about your lab results. Right. So okay. they had done my labs, but I didn't really get a walkthrough of my labs at the appointment. So that was really weird to me because I was like, well, that's the thing that you talk about. Like, right. mm-hmm. and so I was just, you know, telling him what my symptoms were. And he was like, you know, this sounds like it could potentially be symptoms of diabetes, but when we check your lab work, we'll see what's happening. So eventually my lab work gets checked and they see that my fasting glucose is 323 MGDL. So it's like sky high. Mm -hmm. Um, And my A1C was 13%. So I was like suffering (laughs) and I I didn't even realize it. Like I was just kind of getting through the day thinking that like, oh, these are normal symptoms of exhaustion and clearly they weren't. And so when I went back for a follow-up, the conversation was basically, you have type two diabetes. Type two. Type two. So like I get, I get this type two diagnosis. Um, And now that I know the process, it was done without even any testing. So I was like, oh, interesting. (laughs) Like they're just basing it off of my A1C and my fasting glucose. Um, And so I had this like really kind of awful conversation with the doctor at that time. And he basically said like, you're 26 years old and this shouldn't be happening to you and you shouldn't be in this position. So you really need to get yourself in gear and work a lot harder on your health because this is going to be detrimental to you in the future. So So he he was like blaming you. Yes. And it was like, I, like, I think my jaw was on the floor at that point because I was like, I don't even like, you didn't even tell me what diabetes is. Like you just told me that like, I'm going to die failing. Yeah. And I'm failing. It's your fault. You got to start working on your health now. Yeah. And, and what was interesting about that conversation was that I, I was kind of dumbfounded because I was like, I do work on my health. Like I work out, I am like really like picky about what I eat. I'm very conscious of like, the fact that I have this family history of type two diabetes. And so he didn't even ask me those questions, which was really disheartening. He just kind of assumed like, Oh, your blood sugars are really high and your A1C is terrible. So (laughs) you must not be putting in the work and you must not be. Well, I I think that's so interesting because it makes me just think of how we as a society kind of frame 
type 2 diabetes versus type 1, mm -hmm. that if that doctor or provider knew that you had type 1, it would have been a very different conversation. And it puts so much kind of shame and guilt on people with type 2 that, oh, because this person lumped you as a type 2, it's your fault, blame you, get yourself together, like, you know, I don't want to, very dismissive, versus if you had type 1, it's, it's, it is much more, oh, this is what's happened, so sorry, you know, let me help you through this process. And that's not right. Yeah. Um, that yeah. we really kind of separate things like that. I mean, you look you look at uh, movie stars and famous people who have diabetes. All the type ones are out of the closet right away. But how many people say, "Yeah, I got type 2? Because there's so much societal negativism mm -hmm. on that. So you're right, Jeremy. I think we should be teaching the younger doctors when someone comes down with type two, treat them as if they just got type one. Yeah, that's a great point. So, all right, so Mila, you had this awful initial diagnosis. What did they what did they start doing? Treating you? Did they admit you to the hospital? I'm guessing not. They might have started yeah. you on some medications. What did they do? Yeah. So I started on metformin. Um, and that was kind of like the first line of defense for me. So it was start metformin, um, amp up your exercise and reduce your carbs. Um, and so that was that was the direction I was given. No real like point in any good direction or like referral to a diabetes educator or a dietitian. It was just kind of do it on your own, take this medicine, come back and see me in three months. And so it was a tough adjustment for me because I was kind of like, I don't really know what I'm supposed to do here that I'm not already doing, but I also don't know like how this medication is going to work for me. I don't even know what it actually does. And I'm the kind of patient who is uh, like, I'm a little bit, I don't know, particular, I guess. You're, 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 so, pro like, you're proactive. You know? Yeah. Uh, proactive is a better, is a nicer <laughs> way of saying that. And so I like knowing what I'm taking and what mm -hmm. it's actually doing and how I can best maximize what I'm doing with that tool. And so I um, didn't get the heads up about metformin, which as you know, extremely terrible gastrointestinal effects. And so mm -hmm. um, yeah. I was and just kind of probably like, didn't work in terms of your blood sugars. I'm guessing. Yeah. So it did for a while, actually. So I started on metformin and then eventually I was put on Jardiance and metformin together, yeah. um, which helped for a while until it didn't until like my blood sugars went down nominally. I think my A1C went down to like 10%. So it was like a pretty minimal, like, um, change in my a1c and then it all of a sudden shot back up after okay. like six or eight months and so i i kind of had noticed this and at that time i was doing finger sticks and so um my primary care doctor and you guys might laugh at this but he wanted me to do like six finger sticks a day so like early morning when I woke up fasting after all of my meals, if I felt any sort of symptoms or I felt weird, do finger sticks then. He wanted me to keep them in a handwritten log. And I got tired of that after like the first week. <laughs> I was like, I can't do this. Well, Mila, um, you know, can I, can I maybe just jump in there for a quick second? Yeah. So you're saying it helped you minimally. And I'm assuming that you also were, was paying a lot more attention to what you were eating. So when you think about you got the diagnosis. You probably made some changes in your dietary habits and it still did not drop right. too much. What was interesting though also was that a few months after my diagnosis, I dropped 30 pounds like within mm -hmm. probably three to four weeks, which is a lot. Like it's yeah. a lot to lose at one time. And instead of seeing that as an issue, <laughs> um, my provider at the time was like, oh, great job. You did great. But I was like, but my numbers aren't increasing. And this is really kind of alarming to me. Yeah. Also. And maybe it's a, a time to talk about like how we, when we see people or patients, Steve, distinguish between type one and type two and what kind of red flags might go up in our head that would make, you know, if we saw Mila back then think, you know, this isn't a kind of classic type two. So, you know, when a patient walks in our door and we're kind of trying to decide if they have type one or type two, you know, you try to put the whole story together and kind of classic type two tends to be older. What does that mean? You know, you know, probably fifties, you know, sixties kind of thing. 43. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> um, and, um, why'd you pick that number? 
<laughs> so um, also, you know, tends to be, you know, run with, with uh, weight, obesity, tends to be, you know, family history of type 2 diabetes, et cetera. Versus type 1 classically is, you know, people that are kids, um, tend to be thinner, tend to be no family history. But you can see easily how there might be some things that don't all fit. So Mila was clearly, you know, you were 26, you said. Yeah. So just that in of itself should make somebody think, hey, this isn't, you know, kind of a classic type 2. But you had, you know, a family history of type two in your family. And you said at the time that you, you know, were overweight. So we can't beat up the provider too much because they're so used to seeing type two walk through the door and you fit some of these kind of criteria in their head. But the age really said it should have set somebody off. You know, what really was striking to me is you did the effort to lose all that weight and your blood sugars did not improve. To me, if you were a type two, you, you might have been off all therapy, yeah. losing that much weight because it all relates to insulin resistance. But, you know, I think that age is something that should always strike someone like, hey, this, this is not that typical. So what do we what do we do about it? So, again, if we go back in the time and we were seeing Mila um, or if you're listening and you're thinking maybe my diagnosis isn't right or how would I know there's four or five actually auto antibodies that we can now check in people's blood. These are the same antibodies that we check to see if somebody's at risk for type one diabetes. Um, you don't have to kind of know what they are. You can ask to get tested for them, but if any of them come back positive, it makes you think that this is an immune process, more likely type one diabetes. And the other thing we check is something called the C peptide, which is a specific measure to show how much insulin the person is making. Versus if they're injecting insulin, it doesn't measure injectable insulin. It's only what you're producing. So again, if we went back in time, and maybe you can tell us if you eventually got these, these tested, you probably did. Um, some, one or more of those antibodies probably would have come back positive, and your C-peptide would have been very low, showing that you're not making insulin. And then you put that with, yeah, you're young. You can actually make this, this diagnosis of type 1. But we can see, again, that even though your blood sugars were high, you were surviving, you know, you weren't throwing yeah. up and going to the hospital like Steve and I when we were 15. So you can see how it like, again, it can kind of be confusing because you weren't crash and burning. You were, you know, kind of doing okay, not on insulin. Yeah. I'll just add one quick thing. These antibodies that Jeremy's talking about, uh, all four of them are, are really important when you get first diagnosed, but there's one for all you listeners out there that remains positive for years and years after the diagnosis, the other antibodies fall off. It's called GAD, G-A-D. And it's what does on that stand for? Glutamic acid decarboxylase. Oh, well done. <laughs> yeah. And don't ask me how to spell it. But it's, um, yeah, it's a very co common test that we get in clinic when someone says, yeah, they were diagnosed seven, eight, ten years ago. We always order the GAD. Now, the other thing I just want to say, this might be too doctory, but uh, the C-peptide, as Jeremy said, is an indication of endogenous insulin production by the person's pancreas. And that could be misleading in the very beginning Again. because you still may be able to secrete insulin, especially people with LADA or someone that might be in the honeymoon period, the period that soon after their diagnosis of type one, their pancreas is trying to secrete insulin. So it's not bad to get the test for sure, because we know if it's really low, uh, it can help you. And if it's super, super, super high, then you're probably on the type two diabetes spectrum. So it's uh we don't want to get too complicated, but I think I wish most healthcare professionals uh, in primary care could listen to this podcast. Yeah, and the last thing I'll say, and then I want to hear Mila's next step. Yeah, we in should let saga. Mila talk once yeah. in a while. <laughs> but the weight loss thing is is interesting too. So what's going on there is your blood sugars get so high that your kidneys, you know, you can't hold on to all that glucose, and it actually you start just peeing out a lot of sugar. So you actually start peeing all the time as your body is trying to get rid of the glucose. And that's why people start getting so thirsty because they're, they're dehydrated from peeing all the time. I remember when I was diagnosed, I thought of it the other way around. Oh, I was drinking so much water, so it was making me pee. It's actually the other way around. But when you're peeing out that much glucose, you actually lose weight. So a lot of people, like for you, again, another kind of red flag would be that you lost a lot of weight, showing that you were spilling a lot of glucose into your urine, making me think that you need, you need insulin. All right, so there you are. You're diagnosed. You're 26, maybe going on 27 now. You're on some meds that don't work. Fast forward or tell us when it actually happened and how it happened that you got the diagnosis right. Yeah, so I eventually I left that provider because I didn't feel heard and I felt like there is something 
happening here and I'm just not getting the answer. I'm just being told to try a little harder and it should get better. Um, and the kind of like straw that broke the camel's back for me was that I was so sick of doing finger sticks and I had seen a commercial for the freestyle Libre and I was like, this is awesome. Like I can just stick it on the back of my arm and scan it with my phone. Cool. And I don't have to worry about like logging numbers that I probably fake because I did them in the long like, <laughs> my appointment. Like, no, this is good. This should be better for everyone. And so when I brought it up to that provider initially who had diagnosed me, he said no. And he was like, that's going to be too much data for you. It's going to be too much information. Stick to finger sticks. And I was like, yeah, no, that's not happening. So then I went, I moved to another provider who was amazing. And so like my first question to her was, hi, can I have a Libre? She was like, I don't know what that is, but let's do it. (laughs) So So was this, can I ask, is this other provider now an endocrinologist or is it still primary care? No, still primary care. Because at that point I didn't know that I needed to see a specialist. Specialist, Yeah. Yeah. And so um, I spent probably about from the time period of me being with that first doctor to the second was about three years. Um, And so then when I moved to this new doctor, she kept looking at my labs and she was like, there's just like something kind of wrong here. Like we're, we're giving you like high doses of medication. She was like, I'm hesitant to put you on insulin because I don't want you to get there, which I thought was also interesting, um, was the hesitancy for me to go on insulin being labeled as a type two. Um, can I ask, sorry, this whole time, this three plus years, your A1C is what over 10, over 10. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it started out at 13. I think the lowest that I had got it during that time period was to nine. Right. Um, and so I was like, it's still not enough. <laughs> right. and- Mila, you hung in there three years. Yeah. You are the most patient <laughs> person I've ever met. Well, I think patient is a nice way of saying it. But, you know, this is, I think, where a lot of the anger comes from, from people. Oh, gosh, this was three, four years that was I doing damage to my body? I was, you know, potentially dismissed by the healthcare system. Um it shouldn't have been that hard. And especially going back, it becomes so clear that yeah. clearly that can make people frustrated and you got a big smile on your face, but I would be pissed off. You know, like yeah, why couldn't I mean, we have gotten this right from the beginning? Yeah. And that's like, after, so after I was seeing um, this new doctor, she had finally said, I feel like I'm not doing right by you by trying to manage your care. And I really think we need to send you to an endocrinologist because your A1C isn't coming down. I don't want to put you at more risk for complications. And like, she was like, I'm happy to manage your care, but I just don't know that I'm giving you the right tools and doing the right things for you to get your A1C back into range. And so um, I I was just like, okay, that's like honorable <laughs> of you yeah. to say and to um send me to someone else. And so when she did, I went to go see um, the endocrinologists that actually my mom was seeing at the time. And um, when I walked in and I told him my story and I just, at the end of the conversation, I was like, look, I am so frustrated. And I just, I want an answer. Like if you test me and I have type two, I'm great with that. I just need to know. And like, Mm -hmm. I, I just want to know what I have to do to like move forward. And he kind of laughed a little bit and he was like, I'm not going to like label you and say that this is a classic case of LADA, but this sounds like LADA. So Mm -hmm. let's get you tested and see what comes out of it. And so of course I got the antibody tests and my C peptide tested. My C peptide was like extremely low. So my Mm -hmm. body it's barely making insulin. And then I was positive for GAD um, and positive for IAA, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an insulin autoantibody. So, yeah. Yeah. So Good. if I, thanks. I, you got, <laughs> you got the hard one, GAD. <laughs> um, so, you know, and I think you just mentioned a lot of important things. So I think it's, interesting if we think about kind of how our healthcare system works in terms of who takes care of people with diabetes And there's this kind of general understanding because there's just simply not enough endocrinologists out there that primary care doctors handle quote unquote routine type two diabetes. Um, You know, people that they kind of put you in that category, somebody that was just on oral medications, not on insulin. Um, We only typically get involved in type two when people go on to needing insulin, it gets a little bit more quote unquote complicated or if somebody has type one diabetes. So there is this sense 
I think, a failure for a primary care doctor if they cannot take care of somebody that is on you know, newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes. And that was probably part of the delay in you getting referred to a specialist is just that that's kind of how our system is organized. And you unfortunately fell into that loophole where you were misdiagnosed and it took you a long time to get to the specialist. Yeah, I'll just add that there are a lot of primary care doctors that feel they should never refer. And this doctor was going to let you remain high f- for as long as you come back, coming back to see him. I really respect your second uh, doctor, the woman who just said, this is outside my knowledge base. Let's refer. And that's the beauty of primary care. We don't, they, they can't be experts in every area. So I want to send her a box of C's candy. Can you send me her address? <laughs> I can. She sounds, she sounds awesome. Yeah, she was wonderful. And I mean, just like so empathetic, so understanding. When I told her, oh, I want this thing that like you have no clarity on. She was like, well, explain it to me. I I want to know more about this technology. And so like, it was nice to have those conversations and to be heard for like the first time in the entirety of my diagnosis was yeah. like four years after I was diagnosed. Um, well, Mila, I got to say one quick thing. Cause when you mentioned, you know, checking your figure finger stick, six times a day that was ridiculous well there was a time before yeah i was gonna say that CGM. sounded like what happened when i was diagnosed but you know it's you know, completely changed now because yeah. you know if you're a type one as you know you need to know what your blood sugar is multiple times a day and i started off on urine testing then jeremy spoiled went straight to finger sticks mm-hmm. and um you know what uh, i think we can talk all day about how important uh continuous glucose monitoring is. and thank Thank goodness for good companies like Abbott and Dexcom and the others that uh, that advance this technology that people don't even realize how important it is. I don't care what type of diabetes you have. Yeah. When people are newly diagnosed, you know, and get right on a CGM, I'm so happy that they're using this technology, but a little angry that, you know, I didn't have that, you know, when I was first diagnosed, couldn't get right into <laughs> CGM. All right. So, Mila, you see this new endo, you get your antibodies, see peptide, they tell you. You have type one, I guess. Uh, that's what they said. What was your reaction? Um, so I was a little bit shocked because I was like, kind of thinking to myself, like, there's no way, <laughs> like, this isn't how this is going to happen. Um, and then I also felt this sense of relief because I was like, mm. okay, now I have an answer now, like I'm going to be on insulin. Um And then, so like, that was my feeling in the office. Like I was just happy. I like thanked my endo for listening to me and for just like understanding that this is like where I could be. And then I left the office. I got in the car and immediately started crying because I was like, I have been living this way for like four years at this point. It was 2016 to 2020. I got diagnosed or re-diagnosed at the end of 2020. Um, so like also during COVID when like there are all of these emotions anyway about like having diabetes and trying to live in a world with the pandemic, I just felt like a little bit of this sense of relief, but also just so much anger at the fact that I, I could tell that something was wrong and I kept doing my best to be persistent about raising that flag. And I just never felt listened to, um, And so it was like this moment for me where I was like, somebody finally listened to me and like, now my health is going to be better because of it. Um, But then I was also angry because I had been told over time, um, basically like, you never want to get on insulin when you have type two diabetes, because that just means that you're too far gone and it's, you've done so poorly that like, now you have to take insulin. And so it occurred to me in that moment, like, oh my God, I'm going to have to take insulin for the rest of my life. Like no breaks. I don't, I don't get to just like walk away from this. And like, now this is like, there's no chance of remission or reversal. Some people will say, um, for me ever. And I'm always going to live with diabetes. And like in that moment, it just kind of hit me like a ton of bricks, like, oh, okay. Like my life has changed truly forever. Um, and it was, really hard to cope with that. <laughs> that's a that's a range from, you know, relief, you got the diagnosis right, so now I got to deal with all this and that's, you know, and plus unpacking 4 years of, of kind of all of that, yeah. you know. Yeah. And again, 
it's so common. So tell us like now in your life, you must have met so many other people that have gone through this. And what's that general kind of conversation like that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think in terms of like the community that I have kind of found after being misdiagnosed has been really interesting um, because even along the time that I spent with my misdiagnosis, I had so many other people with Lada tell me, oh, I like what you're doing doesn't seem like it's quite right for type one, like have your doctors tested you? And I was like, well, no, you know, it's just like, this is what they say. And so that's what I'm paying attention to. Um, And so I had a bunch of people kind of raise the flag for me, like when I would talk about like my treatment and like what I was taking and what I was doing and how it was working for me. Um, But then also just to have so many people stumble across my work and so many people stumble across my stuff and feel like they're not alone. I was like, thank goodness, because when I first got diagnosed and then, and then even re-diagnosed, like I didn't know a single person, Mm -hmm. um, like what's the word? Like, I don't know. I wasn't like friends with anybody that had Lada. I just had like outside observers kind of tell me, oh, hey, like this doesn't seem quite right for you. And so it for me was awesome to finally meet people with LADA who kind of understood the ups and downs, who understood like that sometimes dosing for insulin isn't super straightforward because sometimes my body decides to make insulin and then we go low or like that there are these like, it's like a balancing act kind of. People that understand, that get you. And I always talk about we both do, Steve, that things that made the biggest difference in our lives of having diabetes and sure technology always comes up, but meeting Steve and having a, you know, somebody else who kind of gets you and you can have these conversations with means, it means a lot. You want to brief, briefly yeah. hold my hand for a second? <laughs> He's a little bit far away from no, me. So I, a- absolutely. Jeremy and I were at a faculty meeting this morning. His blood sugar was high and I handed him some of my, uh, Afrezza <laughs> to bring it down and, you know, and everybody's and, you know, kind of looking at us it. like, what is that? You I know? didn't say, why'd you go to the all you can eat? breakfast place i didn't say you that you just said it now <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> so like what do you expect jeremy <laughs> so mila tell the, our listeners where they can find you you know how you kind of use this in your career tell us a little bit more about that yeah so i um started off writing my blog it's called the hangry woman um which was actually a joke about hypoglycemia because <laughs> i would get hypos and become very very not nice. Um, and so I had a friend tell me, Oh, you're kind of hangry. And I was like, I really <laughs> like that. <laughs> I think that's fun. Um, and so I just started kind of sharing like recipes, diabetes friendly recipes, um, that were working really well for me that were still tasty, but included healthy swaps and healthy additions. And then over time, um, I, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I'm, always really interested and like deeply interested in things that are in my orbit. And so I started to become really interested in just the day-to-day living aspects of diabetes and how it works for people everywhere, like around the world. And so I started just kind of chronicling, this is what a day in my life is like as someone with diabetes and here's what I do. Here's what I eat. Here's where I go exercise. Um, And eventually, like, I had a community of people who were like, oh, I didn't know that someone like you existed. And I thought that I was living kind of in this space by myself. And now I really like following your stuff because I like seeing how it kind of mirrors what I'm doing. Um, And so I ended up making, like, 100,000 friends online. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Yeah. That's like 999,000 more than I have. It's pretty pretty good. (laughs) Well, you got got one. Yeah, I got you. (laughs) Yeah, you got one. Maybe so too. I think, you know, kind of adding the, you know, to kind of start closing out the provider part of this, that the people are probably listening and they've said, well, I've had type two diabetes for 30 years and, you know, is my diagnosis wrong? What do I need to do? So, you know, I would say if you've been diagnosed with type two diabetes and, you know, you're being treated with medications and your A1C is in good control, no, you don't need to run out and ask for antibodies and C-peptide, et cetera. But if you've been semi-recently diagnosed with some form of diabetes and you're not responding to treatment, something just isn't jiving, that might be a time that you should ask your provider to kind of think about it again. So again, even providers will ask us, should we at, at, 
at new diagnosis, should we check antibodies on every single person and see peptide in every single person? No. I think if you have kind of a classic, true textbook case of type 2 or type 1, you don't need to go that. But if there's anything that doesn't fit these kind of textbook diagnoses, and for you it was really your age, then yes, you need to be kind of like, um, you know, kicking the tires, looking under the, yeah. you see know, a, the rocks see a, a specialist, you know. Yeah. So anything you want to say in closing? I, well, I would say, uh, Mila, say, thank you so much for sharing your story. Mm -hmm. I cannot see you getting angry. to be. <laughs> so next time you get low, have your friend videotape. Because <laughs> I think that's so interesting. I know people's personalities change when they get low. Um, and, uh, and, you know, but, but, but seriously, uh, thank you for talking about your own story, opening up, and it, it's going to help a lot of people that will listen. And yeah. you know what? You should definitely, once the podcast comes out, uh, send it to your uh, PCP. Yeah. The, the original one and the new. Yeah, the yeah. One. To both of them. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, yeah, your story is unfortunately common. And it's just so good for people to kind of hear about it, that what they might have been gone through is, is, is happened to other people. And also knowing, by the way, closing on a positive note, that, you know, I, I'm assuming that you've gotten your blood sugars under control, doing much better. That, you know, initial three, four years, it's, I think people can feel like it's going to haunt them and eventually it's going to come up 30 years later that your, you know, your foot's going to fall off, your kidney's going to fail because of that misdiagnosis. And I just tell people, once you get it under control, you're good. You know, don't kind of get yourself hung up on what happened back then. Just be, you know, try as much as you can to stay in the, in the, the current day. You got the diagnosis right. You're doing the right things to, to keep your blood sugars under control and you will live a long and healthy life. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks again, Mila, for joining us. I'm sure we'll, you know, be doing a lot more with you, hopefully with TCOID. Yeah. And thank you everybody for listening. And with that, I think we'll say so long. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mila. Thank you.